Hello and welcome to what can only be described as the top gun of cybersecurity. I'm Morgan Wright and today we're going to talk about probably the biggest threat facing your enterprise today and that is spear phishing. First, before we do that, let me throw out a list of names that may get your attention. Let's talk about the Carbonac bank attacks. One billion dollars uh, taken. JP Morgan Chase, 90 million accounts hacked. We've got eBay, 145 million accounts. We have Target, 110 million accounts. We've got Anthem, 90 million patient records. We've got Sony, 47,000 employees and their social security numbers. Tyson Krupp, we've got the Office of Personnel Management, of which I was a victim of also, and we've got the State Department and the White House and the uh, Defense Department. All of these attacks, every single one of them started with, guess what? That's right, spear phishing. And to talk about this today, we've got Kevin Mitnick, known as the world's most famous hacker and a speaker, author, and consultant. Great to be here. Yeah. yeah. Darren, hey, Darren, the same thing with you. Um, uh, Darren Anderson, uh, CEO of Cybertech, great networking firm. So, I mean, you guys do a lot of stuff around the country. Yeah, thanks. Nice to be here. Okay. Ken Baylor, I, I love the name Stealth Worker, too, CEO of Stealth Worker, former CISO for a lot of Fortune 500 companies as well. Glad to be here, Morgan. And then we've got Leon Rishnu. Leon's the Vice President of Engineering at CloudMark. I know you've got a lot of good stories for us today. Thanks, Morgan. Let's talk about what we said was the biggest threat facing everybody right now, spear phishing. And so I kind of want to mix this up a little bit, but let's kind of get a hacker's view of this. Let's start, you know, Kevin, we kind of talked about this. If you could only, if, if you could come back now 20 years later and you were yourself 20 years ago, but you could only pick one technology tool, you know, one tactic like that, what would it be and why? It would be social engineering because it's really difficult for to protect the human element, and it's the easiest way in, and corporations have a very difficult time defending against these types of attacks, and it's extremely successful. In fact, I do penetration testing for a living. Companies hire me to break in, and when they allow me to use social engineering and scope of the test, 100% success rate. Let's, let's make sure we define a couple terms. Number one, spear phishing. So let's talk about what is spear phishing, and then let's talk about social engineering to make sure we baseline this. So what's your view, what's your thought about the definition? Well, well social engineering is using manipulation, deception, and influence to get a target to comply with a request. It's, that's as simple as that. When you're talking about phishing is when you're kind of blasting out a, like for example, an email to right. an entire organization and just getting somebody to click a link, open up an attachment or something like that. Spear phishing is very meticulous. This is where you're doing information reconnaissance, you're learning about the company, you're learning about the people, you're looking at trust relationships, you're looking for you know, partners, suppliers, customers, vendors, uh, and then you go in and you target somebody within the organization, maybe start a dialogue, develop rapport, and then at a point you send the payload. The payload could be a Word document that has a macro. It could be a link to a site that pops up a Java applet. So when somebody clicks on that Java applet, they get in. It could be a booby-trapped uh, PDF, an Adobe Acrobat PDF file. So when somebody clicks, it exploits the software that sits on the desktop. So using these payloads, then the attacker actually gets onto the computer of the individual who fell for the attack. Right. Once that happens, then the attacker works his or her way to other systems on the internal network. That's the scary thing about spear phishing is when we're doing, well, when a hacker tries to break into your company by exploiting like a web application, for example, usually they end up on what we call the DMZ because if you have set up your architecture right, you don't have your systems on your internal network that are facing the internet. But with spear phishing, that's directly targeting the human once their machine is compromised, their desktop, their laptop, that's sitting right on the internal network and yeah. gives the attacker much greater visibility into the network. Leon, let's go to you. I mean, um, you've been you've been your vice president of engineering at Cloudmark. You've seen so much stuff over the years. Why does spear phishing continue to be so just effective? I mean, we haven't got we we'd like to eradicate it, like you know sure. polio like stuff, but we can't. What I mean, what are you seeing out there that makes spear phishing still so effective? Uh, as Kevin mentioned, it's the human element. And the more that people put themselves out in the world on LinkedIn, on social media, they put information out there that you can harvest. You can harvest that. You can find out who the CEO is. You can find out who the finance people are in an organization. You can manipulate that. You can manipulate the relationship to build a trust. Uh, 
a trust interaction between between you and the individual and the victim to a point where you can you can start to get them to to give you information and, and open attachments click on links start to take actions that will that will allow you to get entry into that environment Darren kind of go over to you here and part of this works because we've got so many things I mean this it used to be the internet of things right now it's kind of becoming the internet of everything why is that expanding you know all these attack services why is that expanding all expanding all these threats that we have out there well hacking the human really is the point of least resistance and historically that's meant on our laptops and our desktops uh, even our smartphones but now it's really expanding to be all the things that I call the wearables the livables and the drivables so everything that we're utilizing in our life to be more productive actually becomes another uh, part of a attack vector and footprint that the bad guys can exploit you know and um, Ken let's talk about you because I know you've done a lot of stuff what do you see especially from these unfilled jobs I know that's got to be causing some concerns but what are you seeing around spear phishing that's causing you concern well, I think the, the big thing in spear phishing is the, the quality of the spear phishing has gone up tremendously they're using uh, vectors such as LinkedIn Facebook to get a current uh, events and knowledge of who's who in the organization and they're also able to then look up and say hey how is the email configured for this enterprise where they can easily do it from a Google search. But also we're seeing a lot of data is no longer in the enterprise, it's all over lots of cloud providers. So if you can manipulate a human, you can steal a whole bunch of data. But even if you had a, an intelligent corporate information security organization watching where they think most of the data is, well not all the data is there anymore. So people can be robbed blindly from an intellectual property perspective, completely fished, and the organization will never even know about it. Never know. Folks, for you folks listening in on this video, you know what that means? That means you, your reputation, your company, your job is on the line when things like this happen because we know. Look at all of these high profile breaches, at least in the private sector, a lot of accountability, a lot of people have been fired. And so what we want to do is give you the tools, the tactics, the strategies, but more importantly, the insights so you folks can help make these new decisions and these good decisions. So let's do this real quick before we have a talk. We've got a video. Remember when I talked about those top 10 hacks? We're going to get into those things and talk about some of the tradecraft. So let's roll this video right now. We're going to go into a little bit more detail of these videos and then we'll be right back with you. Disturbing news about a cyber Today, a shocking report from a cybersecurity firm. J.P. Morgan Chase reported hackers had stolen information. eBay said that it had been hacked. Massive cyber attack. The company Ubiquity has been scammed. A sophisticated cyber attack on the health insurer Anthem. The attackers used a classic hacking technique. A number of attacks are now being attributed to Russian hackers. Hackers working for Russia breached the Joint Chiefs email system. A cyber attack that penetrated the West Wing. Involving up to 110 million customers at Target. $46 million. 83 million customers, 145 million users to change their passwords. Hackers reportedly got hold of some of the president's emails. Intelligence agents are impacted by this. They're being pulled out of China. The Russian security company says a hacking ring has stolen up to a billion dollars from banks around the world. What was interesting about that video, and guys, we're going to talk about this, is just is the breadth and depth and reach of some of these attacks. I mean, J.P. Morgan, OPM, of which... Full disclosure, you know, my classified personnel file was one of those exposed in it. Nine months later, I finally got my notification. Yeah, and Ken, you had a, your former position uh, being a CISO, like I said, for a Fortune 500. If, if it's demonstrated that these attacks had a negative impact on things like bottom line, on mm -hmm. stock price, on reputation, I mean, if that it, kind of negative impact, why are we not taking it seriously or what can we do to change that? I mean, if you were a CSO right now advising a company, I mean, you wouldn't advise them, hey, do this because it's going to have a negative impact on our profits, right? Correct. And when you start looking inside an organization, there's a couple of things that are happening. Board of directors, by the way, usually do not have a corporate email account. They generally have an AOL or Hotmail account. They're actually the <laughs> most vulnerable <laughs> people out there. But we'll leave that aside for the moment. Um, but you're right, there's a, with the OPM hack and the target attack, I mean, you, CEOs and senior leaders have actually lost their careers, not just their jobs. So that's kind of one side of it. But what we're seeing inside the organization right now is this massive growth of mobility and uh, people have their data no longer inside the company, but quite often in SaaS situations. And um, they're, they're very, very susceptible to these attacks. A lot of people respond urgently. They go through high volumes of email. They try to respond very quickly, and they don't often do their due diligence, especially when something comes from a board member who may have been fished or a uh, or the CEO or something that seems urgent. The attacks have become more sophisticated because they are, uh, they're doing all the reconnaissance. It, you know, in three years ago, 
you'd see very little spearfishing. It was all very much fishing. This is surgical. This is, at, this is attacking one individual, one corporation, and trying to gain access through that. Um, we're seeing a lot of things that don't even have uh, uh, penetration of the defenses to compromise a system. We're seeing wire fraud going on. We're seeing, we're seeing a, uh, a finance person get an email from a CEO with a sense of urgency, must wire this transfer, critical gotta for us as now. a company, got to do it now. Now, if you receive a instruction to wire a whole bunch of money and it's right at the last day of the quarter, the chance that that's going to go through is actually probably 99%. Let's talk a little bit about tradecraft, because you okay. and I had talked a little bit about this. Um, for these things to happen, there's basically two parts, and like you described it, you talk about the con. The which con is, and the exploit. The, so, the con is the social engineering piece. That's where we spend time building up trust. We talk to each other, and then once the hook is set right, now it's deliver the payload. So let's talk about that. Well, it's kind of like this. So for example, you have the con, get the target to open up at the attachment, for, for example, and then what happens is once the victim opens up that attachment, it exploits a vulnerability in the software that resides on the desktop. So basically, at the end of the day, you have one employee inside the organization, just one person just that one. falls for the attack. Now the attacker has complete c control over that desktop or laptop. Uh, to bring up on Kevin's point, there's also a thing we call a leapfrog attack, which is where you're trying to target somebody of very high status inside your organization, but you can't get to them. But if you get to somebody inside your organization, now you've got access to a, a desktop right. and a valid email that could send an email to somebody who's assumed to be on a valid machine, coming from a valid corporate email, so there's a lot more trust. So we're seeing a lot of those kind of leapfrog attacks. Once you're in, you get up there. Here's the thing that amazed me though, Leon. You guys, and you guys remember this too. Remember two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, everybody said email marketing is dead. You know, it's going away, email is dead, right? Email is not dead, is it? 91% of these attacks? 91% of these attacks come through email. Why? Everyone uses email. It's free, it's easy to, it's easy to put up. Every company has email. Uh, every company publishes MX records for, to receive email. That's how they communicate. That's how business has evolved. And it's a standard mode of communication in business. And it's very unlikely the attacker will get caught. That's another good reason. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, With a just, phone call, oh, you the, can get, your voice can be recorded, for example. With an email, um, usually it's very difficult to uh, you know, attribute the attack to a particular person. Yeah, and I'll tell you, uh, because yeah, it's, it's low probability of risk, high probability of success, and these things keep working. Um, you know, it just amazed me when we said it's 91%. I mean, we're, we're still, because every employee at a company gets an email. They may not get a phone, right, a mobile phone, but what does everybody get that works at a company? Email address. You know, email address, right? So this is definitely not going to go away. Like tools like LinkedIn, files. for example, help the attackers create the target list. You could put in a company name, look for current employees, and LinkedIn, or with Salesforce, demo. you have data.com. Yep. You have a lot of resources out there on the internet to actually create the target list, even including metadata. So it's not hard for anyone on the internet to figure out who you're, who, what people are working for the company, what their titles and positions are, and how to reach them. Kevin, let's kind of walk through the anatomy of a hack. I think you said you had a really good example that almost worked 99% of the time. And where this is successful is when we're doing penetration testing. What penetration testing is, it's ethical hacking where companies will hire us to test their security controls. So one of the hacks or the spear phishing attacks that works well is where we go in posing as the company's healthcare benefits provider. And it's easy to find who that is. Usually the company will share that with us. And then what we'll do is we'll send out an email to very specific employees that we've researched doing what we, we go through this information reconnaissance phase. Trying to find the likely target, usually somebody is not too technically astute, no, nobody in the IT department, for example, that's gonna fall for this attack. And how the attack works is imagine the employee, the recipient, gets an email, uh, from either the company or the, actually the healthcare benefits provider uh, on behalf of the company right. that they need to accept this new policy, a security policy or any type of policy that we want at the time. And if they don't do it within 24 to 48 hours, they're going to be switched over to Obamacare. So usually there's a high incentive, incentive yeah. a, a very <laughs> strong incentive to go ahead and do it. And what happens is when they click on this link in the email, right, what happens is it pops up and it looks exactly like it's Anthem Blue Cross, for example. It pops up this, what we call a Java applet. 
and the Java applet appears to be signed by Blue Cross and actually gives instructions for the user to click OK to get to the policy. And once they click OK, they go ahead and do that, and it brings up this like EULA type policy. They read it, they usually click I accept. But when they clicked on that Java applet in the beginning that they were instructed to do, that basically ran a program on their computer to give the hacker, or us as ethical hackers, complete control over their system. And you might wonder, like, how successful is this type of attack? 95 to 99%. It That's usually it? always works. Yeah, always works. <laughs> See, and it's so simple. So simple, we gain full control over that employee's desktop or laptop that's connected to the company's network. So let's do this real quick here because I mean, we've been talking about a lot of these things. So hey, I want to kind of toss to you guys now a couple of things. So um, Leon, let's talk about some of the specific types of attacks. But I know we have some examples of some of the. I mean, everybody's going, "What does a spear phishing email look like?" I mean, how does it work? So let's talk about some of the specific attacks, and then I know we're going to be able to show some of these examples. Let's talk about this first one here. Oh. Potential customer. Right. Okay. I'm a sales guy. I've got, uh, I've got sales targets to meet. I've got a website that probably has a sales inquiry. I've got lead gen. I've got people coming in. Uh, if I'm coming, if, if I want to, if I want to compromise that, that's an easy channel. Fill in this and form to make sure. Fill in this form. No, and, the, <laughs> and then the exchange starts and, and exactly. fill in the form. The report. The sales guy, yeah, the sales guy responds, says, hey, thanks for the inquiry. Here's some details. You get the back and forth mm -hmm. going. Pretty easy to do. And then, off goes the NDA, off goes the sales order, off goes, you know. I'd love to talk to you, just sign this little just, document. Hey, yeah, just, just the NDA got, by itself. Just the NDA by yeah. itself, yep. The NDA by itself, right. Let's let's talk about a second email here now because I've seen this one used uh, and it's very effective, right? It's it's the pose as a PhD student, PhD student, it's like, I need your help. I'm doing some research, right? It's it's the same thing. It's masquerading. It, it's creating a persona, it's masquerading, it's, it's appealing to a need it's with giving a reason. It's giving like, a reason. A, you know, it's it's like a, it's it's leg, it sounds legitimate. It feels real. People, again, you brought up the the, the one of helping others, right? Right. And uh, it it works. Well, oh, it's the same uh, thing. You just just go to everyone seeking to hire people in this day and age, and how many resumes come into HR? Everyone's yeah. LinkedIn. It's, it yeah. basically says they're looking for other opportunities. Yep. Right. And see, so you just reach out to them on LinkedIn. Right, and uh, that's not hard to Come do to create like a fake, form, fake LinkedIn profile. We, are, we, we have them already, that we've already set it up for our social engineering assessments. And we can, hey, you know, we're, we, we looked at your qualifications, we have this other project, we'd like to talk to you. We, so, we've seen a really good one right. with uh, when they're posing as HR people, especially they'll target tech people or security people. Then they'll do a technical interview and say, so at your current company, what kind of firewalls have you put in? How have you configured them? How do you detect things like this? And suddenly they're getting the complete you know, architecture of how that company has defended, how to get in there the and steal everything. The way to do reconnaissance, ask the target directly, right? Exactly. What, what and are they, you using? What are you doing? And they'll volunteer it and they'll say, well, we're implementing this, this is our And I'd strategy. like to come visit you. Would you open the door for me and let me do a walk through your data center? Yeah. Or you pose right. as a company well, that's, you know, up and coming and you're, 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 you, you want to follow in the footsteps of, you know, somebody that's matured their security program. Can we talk to you and get a better understanding of what you've done and a lot of companies will open up. Who are some of these hackers? You know, what are the types that we're dealing with when we start talking about spear phishing? I mean, there are private, I mean, it's almost like organized crime or state sponsors or individuals. So what's the kind of the broad scope of that? It could be hobbyist hackers all the way to state sponsored attacks, you know? And I look at it, what does it really matter? Because they want to compromise you. I really, you know, so I, I, I think about it, you just kind of have to think about trying to protect yourself from the problem. The term I like to use called the vanity hack, right? And, and that is, you know, the thing that lures us individually into compromising our identity. So whether I'm, you know, wearing my Apple iWatch and something comes in in that case, Don't whether- bad about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a believer. Um, yeah. uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, the CEO sending me a note or Kevin, you know, sending me a, a link to a copy of his book. I mean, we all like are sort of, you know, anesthetized. And, we want and, to be, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's why I call it the vanity hack. It's when somebody's starting to target you, it's not that hard for them to identify. So like, Darren, you're so great. Here's are. a link to a review I wrote about you. You yes, know yes, you're going to exactly. click that. So that actually brings up a good point. Let's talk about education, how important education is. So Kevin, I know you. Um, one of the things you talk about is one of the things that drives you now, and what part of your passion now is educating people. Is exactly. Them. Let's talk about building security awareness. Traditionally, in the security awareness uh, training program, you want to educate people about the these types of uh, threats. But by in a, these programs by itself, 
don't work. I mean, they work to a point. But unfortunately, there's still Betty in the mailroom that goes, oh, this, this looks like, you know, this Katrina happened and I got to donate and clicks on that link, right? Or something that's happened in the recent news. There's always somebody that falls for it. Or when you're training, you know, if you're not training often enough, people just forget and just go on with their daily work. There's a shelf life of education right? and then it quits, yeah. So that's why to mitigate these types of attacks, you have to look to user education, you have to layer the defenses kind of, you have to look at user education and training. What companies should actually do is actually test their people, see where they stand, look, look you know, do a quick test, see how many people will click on that link, mm -hmm. and you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked when those, right. we when those percentages systems, are what about 30 and 40% oh, yeah. of the company yeah. will do it. And then it's like, oh my God. You know, because now that's a metric that you could look at and go, wow, I really need to do something about this. The thing we've got to get to now, which to me, it's real, it's the learnings out of this, the insight. You see with board of directors, they have become concerned. They, this is actually high on their um, list of issues that need to be attended to. A lot of times board of directors are thinking in terms of risk. This has squarely hit their radar as an area of risk. And starting really with some of the latter stage Sony hacks where you have CISOs and other corporate executives that lost their jobs. Fast forward to Target where you had the CEO, um, the CISO, the CIO all lose their jobs. And in addition, um, a um, group of shareholders that actually threatened to sue and remove all the directors, I believe 14 directors at, um, at Target, definitely caught the attention of boards. And now we see boards that are looking and saying, are what we're getting back from our CIO or even our CEO about our security posture true or is it true? So they're starting to double check. They're starting to sort of valid, you know, they trust, but they're also trying trust to validate. Yeah. yeah, they're trying to verify if actually the, the facts are what they've been told for many years. Humans still are doing the same thing, you know, falling for the same thing year after year, right? So at some point, technology's got to come in and create a higher level threshold, a higher baseline to create that security, right? What are you seeing around that? Um, well, I think you're, you're right. Training is, is where people are at and it's important. But at the end of the day, if you're asking a human who's not qualified to distinguish between uh, an email that is malicious or socially engineered and, and one that's legitimate, you've got to start finding technology that can, that can uh, fill the gap. Uh, a lot of companies in the traditional security space, email security space, anti-spam, anti-virus companies are trying to tackle this. They're trying to tackle this with existing technologies. Right. But really, you're trying to deal with a different type of attack. It's a behavioral attack. It's how do you look at people's behavior patterns in the email world? What are they exposed to? How do they communicate with others? Have they communicated with this person before? And start to look at what's an outlier in behavior. And when you start looking at that, it becomes a very complex right. problem to solve. Uh, and uh, and you know we at Cloudmark have been tackling that. That's been our uh, uh, that's been our focus for for the better part of the past year and a half. Uh, and, and we think we're, we're at a point where the technology can start to help companies. It's the lightning round, okay? One sentence, if we could eradicate spear phishing, what's the impact it would have on everything else, right? So let's reverse order now, let's start with you. If you could eradicate spear phishing, one sentence, it's gonna be tough, Twitter friendly, right? One <laughs> sentence, right? How would the world be different? You could trust your email again, sleep better at night. Well, it was two sentences, but I'm going to let you get by with it. It was a comma. It was a semicolon. Com semicolon. Compound sentence, right? Yeah. Darren. Um, unfettered commerce, um, live, work, and play safely online. All right. Ken. Um, the average person could keep their money in their bank account. Kevin, how about you? Well, help, it would help people be safer. <laughs> but no, guys, it's been great being the wingman here. A, a lot of insights. And look, folks, what we want to do is thank you. We know you've got a, you, you have, your time is precious. You can spend it anywhere. We appreciate that you spent this time with us to learn what we think is probably one of the biggest threats out there that you're going to face that you've got to really figure out a way to address, and that's spear phishing. So on behalf of this Top Gun panel, we want to thank you guys for joining us. I'm Morgan Wright, and we hope to see you in another video very soon. Thanks for joining.